Our sermon text this morning is Romans chapter 1, verse 4. Romans 1, verse 4. I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 4. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God, in power according to the Spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray. Lord God, we gather today uh, with your people on a day for celebrating, uh, to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ and to celebrate his power. Lord, we pray that you would help us to rejoice in our powerful, resurrected Savior today. Help us to see and marvel at the glory of his death and resurrection. Draw our hearts out to Christ and help us to look to him. For we are weak and needy and Christ has power. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. We continue our study of the book of Romans Uh, In the introduction, we talked and we saw that Paul, well, he was called and appointed to be a minister of the gospel of God, right? So so he's the gospel of God guy. He's come and he's got a task uh, from the Lord to minister the gospel of God. And then he explains what that gospel is. And he's explaining it in verse 4. That's, this is, our text is just verse 4. And we want to figure out what this verse means, right? What does it mean that Christ was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead? So what's going on here is something happened when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, right? Right? Something happened. When Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he was declared to be the Son of God in power. So our whole focus today is to figure out what that even means. And then as we see what it means, that we'll rejoice that Jesus is the Son of God in power. And to at least help us think about this, uh, we're going to focus on the power of Jesus And for weak folks like me and you, isn't it good news that we know someone with power? See, some of you today have no power to get rid of your guilty conscience. You've been struggling with sin, and you don't even know if you could ever be saved. And there's one powerful enough to save you. Some of you have been sad and been sad for a long time, and you have no power to get yourself out of that. Isn't it good to know that Jesus has power? Some of you have a cold heart to the Lord, and you've been trying to figure out how to fix that. Isn't it good news to know that Jesus has power? See, see, we need, as weak creatures, we need a Savior with power. Because we have so many needs, and we are so inadequate for meeting those needs, solving those problems. I know the Bible answer is go to Jesus, but the Bible answer today is go to Jesus because he has power. Power to take broken people like us and make us right. And oh, how we need his help. So I hope today it's falls on you as good news that the resurrected Christ has power. Well, what does it mean? We're trying to figure out what does it mean that he has power. 
in order for us to figure this out, we're going to have to think about the gospel. And I've decided today to sort of handle the, this, I, I like to do three-point sermons, that's pretty standard, right? By looking at kind of three maybe important days that we remember in a year, especially if you're a Christian. The one probably you're thinking of right away, Christmas, I know a lot of people, that's their favorite, right? And we, we celebrate the birth of Jesus, we'll talk about that. The other two are very close to each other. You might have called them one, but they're really two separate days. Good Friday, the death of Jesus. Resurrection Sunday, the resurrection of Jesus. They're they're very close together, right? It's it's the third day. Friday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The third day rose again. I just want to talk about those three days. Christmas, Good Friday, Resurrection Sunday. Okay, so first then, and, and here we're using this to help us understand the gospel. So first day then is a promised son who came. So, so the Bible's story about Jesus is that, that the Old Testament said, I'm going to send somebody to save you, right? And that promised Messiah finally came on what we celebrate Christmas Day. Christmas Day is the celebration of God keeping that promise. Now, this might feel like it's sounding like last week's sermon. I'm only going to allude to it briefly. Right? I want to say the first part of the gospel is that God made a promise. That was last week's chapter uh, 1, verses 2 and 3. He made a promise, and he kept that promise in sending Jesus. And the second thing that we talked about last week is that the one who was promised was going to come from the line of David, and Jesus was from the line of David. So that's, that's a bit of what we talked about last week. And yet, what we also see, and we probably didn't spend as much time on, is that the one who was sent was the Son. And what's that mean? What does it, what does it mean to say Jesus is the Son of God? Well, it, it, it's, it's, the, it's the understanding, the Bible's doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, there are, there's one God in three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they've always existed. So there never was a time when there was a Father and not a Son. There never was a time when there was a Son and not a Holy Spirit. God has always existed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, it may boggle your mind. You may not understand it. It's too hard for us to understand. Well, how could somebody, something come from nothing? How could there be one and three? Like, and yet this is how God reveals himself eternally. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So when we get to Christmas, we don't have, as it were, God born. (laughs) In a sense, maybe there is, but in a sense there isn't. What do we mean by that? Well, what happens is eternal Jesus, eternal Son of God, takes on flesh at a particular point and is born in a manger. So before he would have, as it were, not had flesh. He would have only been divine. The other mystery about Jesus is... He is fully God, eternally, and yet at this point, he also becomes fully man. And that's the Bible's teaching on Jesus, and again, I've, I've, I've collapsed a lot, I've simplified it much, but we have here at, at the birth of Jesus, not someone who will one day be the Son of God, we have someone who has always been the Son of God. That's the main point that you need to get here. He's always been the Son of God, and when he was born, he already was the Son of God. This is important. It'll show up later in our sermon, but I need to set that stage right now. Okay, so Jesus is the Son of God, born the Son of God. Actually, born as the King of Israel. Isn't that what we sing? Uh, Noel, Noel, born as the King of Israel. So he's, he's glorious. And yet one of the things that we need to think about Jesus in coming is that he... Well, he humbled himself. And that's the, that's the Bible's way to talk about it. It's humbling if you had always been the one that the angels in the throne room were saying, holy, 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 to, and then you come and you are born in just a lowly stable. Do you see the demotion that would be? it's, it's, It's a humbling thing to never know being tired or being hungry. But to take on flesh and to, to need to sleep and to need to eat, right? So, so the, it's emotions in all sorts of ways, and you're, you're following what's going on here. Now, so, so what we're saying here about Christmas is, and the birth of Jesus, is that the Lord came 
And he actually came to be humble. Right? He, he, he humbled in his coming, and he was born humble, and he was born to be even more humbled, right? Because what's the whole purpose of him coming? What's the next point we're turning to? He came to die. So, let's, we're on, already on to point number two. The second day I told you we would talk about was Good Friday. Good Friday is re- remembering that the one who was born and born to die, did die. You, you, you can't, can't, can't get to Resurrection Sunday if you don't have death. Or you can't celebrate the resurrection of one who never died. So he dies. And we remember this on Good Friday. And again, our verse 4 says that, that whatever's happening about Jesus being the Son of God in power happens by the resurrection, his resurrection from the dead. So the resurrection has to happen, but again, he has to die first. Now, last week we talked about some of the prophecies about Jesus. Some of them are just my favorite ones, that Isaiah 53 passage. I'm going to briefly touch on it, because it, it, it's such a beautiful passage to help us see how is it that someone dying could have anything to do with forgiveness of my sins. You know what I mean? Like, I had a grandma that died. I don't think that had anything to do with anybody's forgiveness of sins. You know, you, you, we, we've all known people. So, so how does it work <laughs> that, that Jesus dies and rises again and that everybody's sins can be forgiven if they come to him? How does, how does that work? And it works because it wasn't just that he died. It's that actually something was going on, and you'd never know what was going on if you just stood looking at the cross. If you just stood and saw a man on the cross, well, he, his death, in a lot of ways, looked like the two thieves on the other side. Like, like, like there's a man on the cross, and he's being treated very poorly now. He's being uh, beaten and all the rest, and he seemed to be beaten more than the other guys, but they're all dying. And the only way you know something special is going on with that guy in the middle is because we have a Bible that tells us what was going on. And Isaiah is, more than a thousand years before this happens, we know what will be going on. And Isaiah 53, in very clear statements, tells us some important things. Verse 6 in Isaiah 53 says this, The Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Again, you'd have never known that if you just stood and saw him on the cross. And yet the Bible says, well, actually, what what happened with that fella in the middle is that the Lord took our sin and put it on him. Right? You you only know this because the Bible tells you so. So Jesus has our sin on him. Now, since our sin is on him, verse 10 makes sense. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. See, if you don't know that Jesus has our sin, it doesn't make any sense that the Father, who loved Jesus eternally, would decide that he wanted to crush Jesus. It doesn't make any sense at all. But if you're thinking, oh, well, now my sins need to be crushed. And they can either be crushed by me being crushed because my sins are on me, or my sins can be crushed by my sins being laid on someone else and he gets crushed for me. Now, that was God's plan of salvation. My sins, your sins, on Jesus. And then now it is the will of the Lord to crush him because the Lord wants to not crush me for my sins. And the solution is crush someone who bears our sins. Punish those sins. And Christ bears our sins. The Lord was pleased to crush him. Then verse 12, he bore the sins of many. We've already covered that. And makes intercession for the transgressions. Transgressors. Now Jesus, having bore our punishment, can intercede for us. Because through his death and through his resurrection, he has defeated sin and death. We'll get to that in a minute. But but there was something going on on the cross, you see. And if you don't understand something that was going on on the cross, it doesn't really make sense to you that I mean, I mean you know, God's. Uh, 
Uh, the father's son died, uh, he rose again, and he just, I guess he just decided to commemorate that with forgiving sins. And that isn't what happened, right? There was, there was, some, there was some transaction going on. A substitute. Someone suffering instead of you was happening at the cross. Now, the New Testament is equally clear that salvation comes through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. John 1.29 the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Well, that's John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is preaching and preparing the way for Jesus. And he says, There's the Lamb. And remember how I was talking about substitute? Right? The substitute. Well, there was, you know, those Old Testament sacrifices. They were all pointing forward to Jesus. Right? It, it, was a, it was a Lamb that was slain in the Old Testament. But it was all pointing forward to what Jesus would ultimately do. He would be the Lamb. He would be the one slain. So that our sins can be forgiven. First Peter 2.24 He himself bore our sins in his body. That's what Isaiah said, right? He bore our sins in his body. On the tree. That we might die to sin. So we won't keep... His whole plan was that we would not keep living the rest of our lives sinning so much. He would break our slavery to sin. We might die to sin. And might live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Which again, that's language from Isaiah 53 again. So the whole point was, Jesus was going to die, bear our uh, punishment, break our slavery to sin. We don't have to sin anymore. We still struggle to not sin, but we're not slaves to sin as we were beforehand. He sets us on the path to live righteously. And we're not as righteous as we should be. But by God's help... By God's power, even, to see where this passage is going, we're able to sin less. To live in ways that honor, to, to walk in the ways of the Lord. And again, it all happened by his wounds, by his suffering in our place. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus was not a sinner, but our sin was laid on him, and he was treated like he did our sins. Now, he didn't do any of our sins. He didn't do any sins at all. But because our sins were laid on him, he was treated like he did them. Right? And this blessed exchange we love to talk about. He had only been righteous. And not only does he take our sins and get treated like a sinner, he who is righteous gives to people like us who aren't righteous his righteousness, and we get treated like we'd done all the righteous things he had done. Now that is, again, what happens in our salvation and what comes to us by faith. By faith we trust in Christ, and when, in trusting in Christ, we get credit for him suffering for our sins, and we get credit for doing all the good stuff he did. There's nothing better than that. Because we're all going to stand before the Lord on the last day. And if you reject Christ, you've only got sin and you've got no righteousness. But if you've trusted in Christ, those sins have been punished already and you do have righteousness. It's not yours, but he gave it to you and you're treated as if you did the righteous things Jesus did. Now, this is salvation. This is the gospel. I'm spending the whole day talking about the gospel. So sometimes we summarize the gospel this way. Jesus lived the perfect life. You should have lived but haven't lived. That's the righteousness part, right? And he suffered the punishment. You deserve to, punish, to, to, to suffer but won't have to suffer because he suffered it in your place. It's a beautiful way to talk about it. And it picks up on those two aspects. Punishment is what we deserve. Righteousness is what we don't have. He gives it to us. And again, this, all this happens as we are united to Jesus Christ by faith. So there's a Savior out there, and if we get joined up to that Savior by faith, then we, we get all the goods <laughs> that he has to give. Romans 8, 1. There's now, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And it's not no condemnation because you never did anything bad. You did, but because of that blessed exchange, you won't be condemned because Christ has been condemned for you. And we get, I keep talking about union. This passage says in. That's, you're in. That's the Bible terminology. But you get the idea. We're connected to Jesus by faith. <clears throat> Romans 5.1 talks about that. Therefore, since you've been justified by faith, 
we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith is what connects us. That's why we tell you to repent and believe the gospel. <laughs> believe, trust, by faith, trust in Jesus. And again, here again, we're doing something important. We're talking about that aspect of Jesus' ministry of humility. See, it, it wasn't just humbling that he had to leave a great place and come to a shabby stable. And that he had a body that didn't have a lot of needs, and now he's got a body that needs to sleep and eat. He humbled himself to be despised and rejected. The people, when they looked upon him, didn't even recognize him as a man. He had been so beaten, suffering so greatly for our sins. The humility was not just that he became a human, but he became a despised human, a hated human, a murdered human. Point three, then, is the victorious son who saves. And now we're talking about the Resurrection Sunday. We're celebrating it today. Verse four says he was declared to be the son of God in power. That's the phrase we need to, we're really trying to get to today, aren't we? Through the spirit of holiness, we need to talk about that. But again, by the resurrection from the dead. Again, the, the phrase then that we want to understand is declared to be the Son of God in power. Now, the reason in point number one I wanted to emphasize that he was born as the Son of God, he was eternally the Son of God, and he was born the Son of God, is if you put together the first part of verse 3, which basically says concerning his Son, concerning his Son, we were already talking about a Son. So the Son was declared to be the Son of God in power. So the difference of the resurrection isn't at the resurrection Jesus became the Son of God. That's not it. That's why I don't want to read the phrase declared to be the Son of God. Because that's not it. He already was the Son of God. The phrase you need to pick up on it, he was declared to be the Son of God in power. Right? So the, so the change or the, the, the main emphasis here is the one who always was the Son of God is the Son of God in power and that's why we want to keep that phrase together. Son of God in power. What does Son of God in power mean? That's what we're focusing on in this section. And it says that he was declared to be, in some of your translations. Sometimes uh, that word would mean appointed to be or determined to be. It's almost like an event happened, and because that event, something changed. The best example I can give, and don't work, take this too far, is imagine you had like a great athlete. He was an elite athlete, right? And, and he, he'd been a great player for a really long time. And finally, he won like the Super Bowl, right? Well, he was a great player before he won the Super Bowl. Now he's a champion. He was declared to be a champion. <laughs> but he, he, he was just as great before uh, he won the Super Bowl as he was after he won the Super Bowl. But this event is, is important, and we ought to mark that in some way. Right? Jesus was always great, but he's the Son of God in power now, because greater than the Super Bowl is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and he's now declared to be the champion... That's one way to think about this passage. Resurrection is an incredible accomplishment. He defeated sin and death. 1 Corinthians 15, 54, 55, and 57. Then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death has no hold on us. Because of Jesus, who was raised in power. So, was it an incredible accomplishment that Jesus died and rose again? Yes, defeating sin and death. You don't ha we don't have to fear death if we are connected to the Savior. The Bible indicates that something wonderful happened, something amazing happened in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Acts 2.36, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. Now, I don't... You, you can see even there in the preaching there in Acts, the Lord has made him Lord and Christ. It seems like something special is happening there at the resurrection, isn't it? 
Acts, or I'm sorry, Matthew 28, 18, what does Jesus say right before the Great Commission? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So again, Jesus seems to understand, the Bible seems to bear out that we, maybe we can't fully describe all that it is, but something wonderful happened there at the resurrection. And part of understanding the Son of God in power, and one part of it is to say, well, there's something going on with the Spirit, isn't there? Because it's according to the Spirit of holiness. And I think that's best to understand as the ministry of the Holy Spirit, or the, the person of the Holy Spirit. But one thing that character, and what we're not saying is there was no Holy Spirit at work in Jesus during his part of his ministry that was characterized by humility. That's not what we're saying. But we're saying that what we, what's going to characterize the ministry after the resurrection, this is where we're heading, by the way, after the resurrection is going to be more characterized by power than it will be by humility. And I think that's the main way to think about what does it mean to be in power? He was the Son of God before, but he was the Son of God as the suffering servant. And now he's the, suffer, and now he's the Son of God who just triumphantly has power. And that's why I started today by saying, do you need help of power beyond what you have? I can tell you about one who has it. Remember the theme, that theme that I just laid out, is I think the, that's the basic argument of Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. So maybe allow me to read that to us. Who though he was in the form of God... Uh, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, that's the humility we were talking about, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. That's, that's all the humility part I just talked about. That's the, that's the, that's the Christmas part, and then the 33 years, and then the, and then the uh, death on the cross part, right? Verse 9, therefore God has highly exalted him. And bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. So the resurrected Christ enters a new era, as it were, of his ministry, as a highly exalted one. No longer the one that people are going to spit upon, but the one who is highly exalted. Again, this new era of Jesus' ministry is not characterized by humility, but by power. We might even say the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, sometimes Christ himself is said to be a spirit. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. There's such a close connection between Christ and the spirit that he's the life-giving spirit. By the way, that's the direction we're heading. His power is supremely seen in his ability to take people who are spiritually dead and give them spiritual life. He's a life-giving spirit. Like So what you most need from the power of the resurrected Jesus Christ is spiritual life, and he is a life-giving spirit. So when I think, and when you think of, he's the Son of God in power, think he's the one who can give my dead soul spiritual life. He can make me a redeemed man or woman. Another passage about the Lord being the Spirit, 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So in some ways, the Lord and sort of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there's a close connection between Son and Spirit. Of course, the Holy Spirit is involved in the ministry of Jesus. And the ministry after the resurrection. Acts 1, 8, you will receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost will come upon you. You will be my witnesses. So after Jesus Christ, we're in the era of ministry in which the Spirit is powerfully working. Empowering us to be witnesses. Or 1 Corinthians 6, 6, 11. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. How were you justified? By the Spirit of God. So then, in this sense, the Son of God in power is his power 
Again, I think he can, he can fix any problem in your life. Um, but the problem he came to save, or the problem he came to address, is your spiritually dead soul and the stain of your sin. And he, he powerfully can wash the most wicked sin. If you've been wandering from the Lord, maybe you grew up in church and then you just left. I want you to think the powerful Lord brought you here today. I think the powerful Lord wanted you to hear that though you can't change you, he can change you. Though you're not the way you want to be and you've been trying to change you, and you absolutely cannot do it, and you're at the end of yourself. There is one who has power. And the first work he means to do in you is to take every single one of your sins and wash them away and save you. Hebrews 7.25, consequently, he is able. He has power, right? He's able To save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for you. Do you believe that the resurrected Christ has power? Praise the Lord that we are gathered here in a room full of people. So many of them have experienced this saving power. They can think of their life before Christ. They can think of the, the, the power of the Lord washing away their sins and of, of taking out their heart of stone and giving them a heart of flesh, making them into new creations. They're not perfect by God's help. They're not slaves to sin. They're not perfect by God's help. They, they, they long to walk in holiness. That change is a change you could never effect on your own. If you've experienced that change, this is just a day for rejoicing. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your power that has changed me. I I could never have changed me. Thank you for changing me. But those who are not, I've been proclaiming to you the gospel from start to finish. I want to tell you that the Lord can save you. The Lord can change you. You can't change you. He can. The Son of God in power can save you. Later in Romans, we'll come to this. It'll be a while, but we'll come to Romans 10, 9, and 10 about our coming to the Lord. It's mentioned many places, but this is the clearest place. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. I urge you today, don't leave this room without confessing with your mouth that you have a Lord and believing that the resurrected, powerful Christ can wash away your sins and give spiritual life to your soul. Come to him today. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for reflection on the glory of the resurrection, the the glory of one who came and was humbled, bearing our sin, bearing our punishment, and powerfully triumphed over sin and death, and has the power to give spiritual life to any that come to him. Lord, we praise you for your saving power in our lives. Lord, we pray that you would powerfully save any who have not come to you, that you might draw them, that you might open their eyes, that you might grant repentance, that you might give the gift of faith. Lord, bring salvation today. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.